know, as we look at the recent events and the events of the past year, it's more imperative than ever that we view our role as followers of Jesus Christ from a biblical point of view. I'm going to just say this. We are struggling in the church from a lack of knowledge of the Scripture. Uh, and I don't say that in any way to condemn, but I want to just challenge you. If you're not reading your word, I, I'm not saying to condemn. Please don't say that. I, I don't want to, to, to hear that. Let me say from a heart of love and, and, and as your pastor, ask God to put a love for his word in your heart. Put, put a love for your... Because you see, the word, the, the scripture is what's going to sustain us. It's, it's not my emotions. It's not what I think. It's not none of those things. not what somebody teaches necessary. It's what does the word say. And, and, and we need that love for God's word in our heart. And we need to be reading it. Every day. We need to be absorbing it every day. And, and listen, there's all kinds of ways to do that. And I know some people struggle with, with reading. And, and I get all those things, ramifications. But with today's technology, you can, you can absorb the word, word on, all many, on so many levels. And you know, I, 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 read, I read a lot. And some of you say, well, we pay you to do that. No, you don't. I, I, I read the word because I have to live in that. Uh, but I, I walk, some of y'all see me out in the community walking, and you know, a lot of times when I'm walking, you know what I'm doing? I'm listening to the Bible. I'm listening because I want to absorb it into my heart. I, I, I want to worship, I want to grow deeper, I want to know God better, I want to know His heart. And so I just want to say that, I, I don't mean to, man, I, I, if I get off on today, you're just going to have to forgive me. Uh, and, and, but please, can, can you ask God, to put a love for God's Word in your heart. It, it is the source of your faith. It's the source and the structure that will guide you. And you know, we hear so many things to tell us who we are when we need to hear only what God says and what He's calling us to. I'm going to say this, the world needs the church more now than ever, even if the world hates us. Amen. This starts with our understanding that we are all called into ministry if we are a follower of Jesus Christ. <laughs> there are no exceptions. From the moment Jesus comes into your life and becomes a part of the fabric of who you are, when He brings His transformational power into your life, at that moment you were called into the ministry. Some of you are going, what? What? It's true. It's just the way it is. You were called into ministry. You say, well, no, I hadn't been to Bible school. I hadn't, been to, I hadn't gone to seminary. No, that doesn't matter. You were called into ministry. So, um, and we need to understand that. We will give recognition to those who have significant roles or, or special places, and we're going to do that today, and I'm so excited. This is just going to be a good day because of that. We will give recognition to those, but all of us are called into ministry. All of us have been given the responsibility to obey God in this, re in this way, and, and, and today I want to just share with you, and I I hope to move quickly through this, but I, I, I want to share with you there are seven characteristics that have made people who are a part of the church effective through the ages. I don't say this to, as I say, to be, convic uh, to be condemning. I'm, I'm convicted by them. I'm, I'm listening to them myself. I'm here to say, and I'm not here to say I'm, I've perfected these in my own life. My, my wife's sitting right here, so I have to be honest. She knows me better than anybody, and she, yeah, you will. Uh, but I'm okay with that. I, you know, that's okay. We walk together, and uh, but I, I, I want. I'm asking God to work these into the fabric of who I am, and that they would become a part of my life and more on a level that I ever have in my whole life. And and I challenge and 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 and. Encourage you to do the same. You know, I, I, Senya asked me, she does our graphics, and she asked me, well, what's, what's the theme for this whole thing? And so, you know, what is essential? And 
I don't, and, and poor Marla, Marla is our, runs her office and she keeps asking me, what's the title of your message? And for the last few weeks, I'm like, I have no idea. I, you know, because I, I'm at this place, sometimes you have to go to where it's not structure. And, and one of the things that God's, one of the seven things in there, that there's one thing that's not in there and you know what it is? And it's not preacher. It's not essential. Preaching is essential, beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I'm not saying that it is important, but it's not the essential component. By the way, the church would live just fine without what we do preaching today, as long as there were good teachers out there. And, and you know, that you would say, man, Jack, you're shooting yourself in the foot here, you know? But what we need is different than what we have. I'm not please. Uh, preaching is important. Don't I'm not minimizing it, but I want to just. There are seven things that I believe God's speaking that we need to that I need to have worked into the fabric of my heart. And and if we're all called into ministry, they ought to be all a part of our lives. That and so the first one I'm just going to share with you today is prayer. And, and we've heard this. If you've been a Christian more than two days, you've heard how important prayer is. Here's the problem: prayer is important, but nobody does it. Oh, that's that's a teacher broad statement. We don't do it as much as we should. Okay? But prayer is born from the reality that the source is God and not us. And I can't speak for you, I can't speak for but I do know this that when I'm not praying it's because I'm I don't really believe I need God. And you can Say, what? You're a preacher. You're supposed to... Here's the thing. If I, if I know that without God, nothing is going to happen, I'll become a person of prayer. <laughs> yeah. The more we know who He is and what He wants and what He can do, the more we can have impact on our world. Jesus is the example before any critical decision, move, or challenge. Jesus prayed, and he's the Son of God. But here's the thing. Here's what he did. We find it from the very beginning. Mark 1, uh, verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and left the house and went to a solitary place, place where he could, what? Pray. He, he, he had this idea that we need to absorb into our own life. If he is the example, if he's the, the picture that we want to live, and if this is what I want God to do in me, here's what I need to understand. He understood something. He could do nothing outside of what his father did in him. If, if, we, if we are not a people of prayer, we're not the church. We're not, because we can't be, because we have to know him. We have to know what he wants, and we have to know who he is, and we have to know what he has possibly can do. And that only comes as we take the word, and the word, and please, I'm saying this, word, the, the study of the word is not one of the seven, because the study of the word is oversees all of this. But if we take what that Bible says, and we go to in prayer, and we begin to listen to the heart of God, we can change our world. Because we will operate not from who we are, but from who He is. Jesus Himself said that everything He did and said did not originate with Him, but with God. In, in John, excuse me, John 8, 28, so Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. It is arrogance to think that I can represent Jesus and not pray. I know I'm going to make some strong statements today, but it's, it's true. And I don't say them, I'm saying them from my own conviction. But how dare I say I can be a representative of Jesus Christ and not pray? Because prayer is that absolute de declaration that I am dependent upon God. Which leads me to the second component of a great minister. 
somebody who is truly capable, and that is humility. <laughs> humility. I love John the Baptist as the example. It says in Matthew eleven eleven, Truly I tell you, among those born, this is Jesus speaking, born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. And I know he goes on to say that the, you know, the least in the kingdom is greater, but he was, he's making a powerful statement there. He's saying, hey, this guy, this guy, he's somebody. And you know what John the Baptist said to that? In John 3.30, he must become greater. Speaking of Jesus, I must become less. And, and that seems so obvious and so, so foundational, but the reality is the way we act and live is sometimes so contrary to that. We draw attention to us, and when we should be drawing attention to God, we need to be walking in humility. James 4, 5 through 10, or do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? He gives us more grace but that's why the, the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. I believe this, that if we really, really want to be impactful, if we really, really want to make a difference, if we really, 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 really want to be the church of Jesus Christ, if we really, really want to have a, a, a destiny, any changing life in our life, we will fall on our face and say, God, I cannot be exalted in your midst. You must be exalted in me. And yet we, you know, we, we, we sometimes when we look at ministry, we look for qualities the world looks for instead of qualities that God looks for. You know, I, I appreciate boldness and confidence in our relationship with God. But arrogance can never be that. And we, I'm trying to be so careful today. Oh. And I'm, I'm not saying it from a, hey, they're bad. We have this tendency to create superstars in the church. And there's only one. <laughs> star in the church his name is Jesus and and anything here's what happens with people and and, and it's it's so true and you know people man, they, they fall in love with Jesus they get they they have a life-changing event with Christ and he forgives them of their sins and he transforms their life and they fall deeply profoundly in love with him and they all they want to do is to share with others that that this thing that's happened in their life and what God that means and and God begins to do use that and their people's lives get be changed and and instead of Jesus becoming the focus the person who's telling the story gets the focus and they become a star and so we exalt people and here's the thing we don't need to do that listen I appreciate your love for me as your pastor, and I want to, to, to always walk humbly in that role. But here's the thing. If you look to me more than you look to Jesus, then I ask you to, to please don't do that. And I humbly ask you to forgive me that I have put your, put, put, put your confidence in me where it belongs to Jesus. I am not your source. I cannot heal you. I can't save you. I can't change your circumstances. All I can do is point you to the one who can if God chooses to flow through grace through something that I might do to him be the glory 
not to me. Amen? We have created a culture of spiritual superstars. And, and we... Oh, i got to move on. Humility. Thirdly, we need to operate in love. You know, last week I shared with you that the Lord was asking me to ask Him. I was like, well, what should I ask? You know, I came into this dilemma. Is, you know, sometimes we ask for what we want when we need to ask for what He wants. Does that make sense? You know, we, and so... <laughs> It's like, well, what do you want, God? Now, when those two things align, when he, what we want and what he wants align, there's a powerful things that can happen. And, 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 where we can, and Jesus said that, that whenever we ask anything like that in his name, he will do it for the glory of the Father. And, 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 and ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. I believe all those scriptures. Here's the problem is that we haven't been asking what God wants. And, and so, I asked God, what do you want? And he said, here's the deal. Jack, ask me to work into you a love for me that you can't create on your own. I, and, and that's, man, that's just been, whoo. We have lost a sense of awe for who God is. How majestic and wonderful. Well, maybe you haven't. Maybe you. I had. I had lost a sense of awe. I know this. I know. But I am asking God to restore to me the beauty of His holiness in my life. That I would be overwhelmed and awed by Him. That my. Not, I would find myself not walking in pride before Him, but in brokenness and humility because He's God. I know he loves me. I know he loves me. I know he's my source. But I want to know him in the wonder of his glory. And to love those things he loves. To love the church and to love the lost. Here's the markers of the church has always been our capacity to love. I shared the verse last week, John 13, 34, and 35. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Here's the reality, 1 John 4, 8. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. I'm going to speak more about this at another time, but Man, we just, if we're going to walk in ministry, <laughs> even speaking truth, if it's not spoken from love, it's not truth. Love. Fourth, if we're going to be in ministry, we have to be willing to invest. The call of God to invest in the lives who, whom we can lead to Jesus. Matthew 28 tells us that we are called to make disciples. I'm going to say that again. We're called to make disciples. Do you know we're not called to make converts? We're called to make disciples. You know, disciples require work. Investment. We are all called to lead on some level. So well, I'm, I'm not a leader. We're all called to lead on some level. We all have influence. All of us. And uh, I don't do a lot of leadership stuff, but, but oh, John Maxwell, he, he, he said something. He said... Uh, if you say you're a leader and nobody's following you, you're just out for a walk. <laughs> Sometimes I think in the church, there's a lot of people out for a walk. Oh, let me get back. Um, 
You know, my goal in raising my children was not to create lifelong, dependent, selfish, self-absorbed, spoiled adults. <laughs> All you parents, isn't that true? I mean, <laughs> my, my goal in raising my children was that they would develop into hard-working, contributing, giving, kind people. Thank God they, they, they have. But, but I'm afraid that that's what we've been doing in the church. We've been creating a generation of people that uh, I, man, I just we just we so often, you know, we tell people, come to church and see what God will do for you. And then when he doesn't do what they want them to do, then they get mad. And, I'm, and we, it's kind of like, you know, a child. If you, I mean, you know, if you don't do what a child wants, they get mad at you. Have you ever had one of your children pitch a tantrum? I mean, lay down on the floor and go, ah! Don't be talking about your spouses like that. <laughs> but, you know, in reality, isn't that kind of what we sometimes do as children of God? We, you know, if we don't get what we want, we get down on the floor. <laughs> and yet, we're called to, to, to invest in people so that they can learn what it means to be a follower of Jesus and navigate the realities that in a walk with Christ there will be struggle. Let me just say that again. There will be struggle. There will be victory. There will be opposition. There will be miracles. There will be trials. All these things are true, just like they're true for all the reality of life. What we do as discipling people is to help them come into the truth and the promises of God based on who God is to walk with the reality. Here's the thing. I might not see what God's doing today, but I will see what God's doing. But it's not up to me. It's up to him. Does that make sense? I, I'm, I'm going to say this. I've been serving the Lord now for 40, it'll be 43 years this May. I, I, I've been, even though I grew up in the church, I, in May of 1978, I came into a relationship with Jesus. It changed everything. It changed the whole dynamics of my life. And here's the one thing. God hasn't always done what I wanted him to do, but he's always done what was best for me. And when we begin to say that we can, you know, that if something good doesn't happen, it's because we didn't have faith. Oh my goodness. How arrogant is that? I, I, if I'm offending somebody, I'm sorry. But we need to walk in truth. We need to walk in the reality of who God is. And I'm asking God, help me to do this. I need to serve the Lord, even if he doesn't do another thing for me. Because he's worthy. And I need to be investing in others to help them see that. My God will win. He always does. He is faithful and he is true. He will bring to pass what he has promised to bring to pass. But that's not my job to determine how it works out. My job is to trust him and walk in him and believe in him and put my confidence in him. And that no matter how it comes, I believe this. Whether he gives it to me today or as I get it in heaven, I will do this. I will trust in the Lord. And I will help others trust in the Lord. We so have contingenced our relationship with God on whether or not we're comfortable, we have missed the beauty of, our, of what we could have in our relationship. I, I need to move on. Fifth one. We need to be spirit-filled. Some of y'all are going, oh, like just, uh, I'm not a Pentecostal. That's not what I said. I said we need to be spirit-filled. Listen, guys, I want, I with Paul, I would that all of you spoke in tongues. I am as Pentecostal as the 
Pentecostal person can be. (laughs) Here's the deal, though. We need to be living by the Spirit. Galatians 5.25, live by the Spirit. Let, if we, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. The reality of ministry is not because we are talented or we have resources or any other such thing. Those things can be tools that we use for the kingdom's glory, but that's not what God needs. What He needs is a vessel that's utterly and completely dependent on Him and who will trust and rely on the Holy Spirit to move through Him. And that's why I I am Pentecostal, because being Pentecostal is, is in reality the expression that ultimately I'm not in control. He is. He's the only one that can be in control. And so I want to live a spirit-filled life. And what that means for me is what Paul prayed in Ephesians 3, 14 through 20. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every uh, family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with a measure of all the fullness of God. Now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine according to his power that's working in us. Here's the deal. The glory of the Lord will be revealed in us, not because we're talented, not because we have resources, not because we have great music, not because we have powerful uh, sound systems, not because we have good buildings. The glory of the Lord will be revealed in us because the power of the Spirit dwells in us and flows through us and comes out of us. I love all those things. But music without the power of the Spirit is just entertainment. Buildings without the Spirit are just buildings. Preaching without the Spirit is just a motivational speech. The church without the Spirit is a social organization. We must be Spirit-filled because He can do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to the power that is at work in us. I'm going to... I'm getting to the end, I promise. Number six, a passion for the lost and hurting. Luke 19.10 tells us that Jesus, for the Son of Man, came to seek and to save the lost. Are we broken hearted for the lost? Are we broken hearted for the hurting? I rejoice in the things that I hear when God is doing amazing things. And um, I got a cute text from Anna. She said, whatever you tell the pastor will be in the sermon next week or something like that. I don't know. It, it's true. I should probably get that coffee cup. I should be you know, my mantra. If you tell me, I'm going to tell. <laughs> but she, she in that sent a text that, at Thrive, where she and Christy work, that in December, 29 babies were saved and 26 women came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. No, no, no. 29 babies were saved and 26 women came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's, That's the business we're about. You say, well, I don't do that. You don't have to. Pastor Rock and several from our church, they go and play soccer on Saturday. They have a great time. I love hearing about it. I love to hear who scored what goals. Right? (laughs) I love this. But you know what's happening is it's not about the soccer. It's about the people. 
It's about people who are coming, and we've got Muslims and Jews and non-believers and all kinds of people coming to play soccer. You know why? So somebody can hear about Jesus. It's, it's about caring about the broken. It's about caring about the homeless. It's about caring about your neighbor. It's about caring about the person you work. It's about caring about the person who voted differently than you. To see beyond the barriers that have been put up by this world and to move into a place where they can experience because of what you have in your heart, the love you have in your heart, because of what's in your heart, what's in my heart, that they can see Jesus and want that Jesus too. My last point, and then we're going to move to the good part. This is the one you probably didn't want me to include. You would have been happy at six. <laughs> we have to be willing to suffer. Oops. You know, in Acts chapter five, it's, it's amazing. In Acts chapter 4, the, the disciples had been brought into the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of the day. They were also had political influence and been told not to preach the gospel. And they said, we, we can't do that. We're going to do it. And Acts chapter 5, you have, uh, it's a great, kind of scary. The first part of it's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Never lie about your giving. Just say it. Ananias and Sapphira. Um, you know, it's getting to be tax time. Do not lie about your giving, okay? Um, but then they go in. This, God's doing amazing things, and the church is, is is growing. There's miracles happening. Powerful things are happening, and and this just gets this this. Matter of fact, it says in in, in one of the verses it says that the religious leaders were jealous. Their hearts were jealous, and so. They arrested the leadership. They arrested the apostles and they put them in prison. And that night while they're in prison, an angel of the Lord comes and, and lets them out of prison uh, without, you know, the doors are still locked. They just gets them out of prison and, and, they, uh, and, they, and tells them to go to the temple the next day and, uh, and to preach and to share about Jesus and talk about Jesus. And, and so they do. They go back to the, the... So early in the morning, they're in there preaching and the Sanhedrin send people to go get them out of prison and they're not there and so they, they, they find out they're down there and they bring them in and, and they tell them, hey, we told you to quit doing that. And they say, well, we have to obey God and do what God said. And, and so they, they send them out and they have this big discussion, you know, and, and they're discussing whether or not, you know, what they should do and some of them want to kill them and, and a guy named Gamaliel gets up and he says, hey, listen, if this is God, you don't want to fight against it. Uh, if it's not God, it'll go away. And uh, and so they said, okay, so here's what we're going to do. So they, they flogged them. What that meant basically was they got 39 lashes or, or whip, according to the Jewish tradition. So they got beat 39 times with some kind of an implement a rod or something. And uh, and having got that, you know, how many of you know if I'd have been beat with 39, I would not be happy. Oh. Uh, yeah. But here's what it says in verse 41 and 42. And the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is Messiah. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know. You 
You know, we in America and some of you who who have come from other places know what it means to be persecuted for your faith. I'm sorry, camera people. You know what it looks like. That may come to our time and generation. I don't know. I hope not. But it may. But we have to embrace this idea that if we're going to truly be followers of Christ, that we have to be willing to suffer for the cause. And I I know that some of you are going, well, that's not what I signed up for. And, And maybe it's just time we be honest with everybody. I'm not wishing that on anybody. I'm not proclaiming that. I'm just saying, we've got to be willing. We, we've kind of, how do you know there's parts of the Bible that we don't, we don't like to read? Have you ever noticed that? Any of y'all ever skipped part of the Bible? I mean, some of it's just because it's boring. I get it. How many begats can you read? You know, so-and-so begats, begat, 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 begat. I'm like, okay, we get it. You know, it's his great, 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 I get it. But there are some places that we don't like to read. We don't like to read where it says, blessed are the persecuted. We don't like to read where Jesus says, unless you hate your father, your mother, your, mo- your, mo- your children, you can't follow me. <laughs> my wife. Now, here's the deal. I love my wife, and that's a biblical command. But if I love her more than I love Jesus, I'm in rebellion. And... As much as I love her, and I would lay down my life for her, I, I would do whatever it took to make her world as best as I possibly could. But if I have to choose between her and Jesus, the best thing for her is for me to choose Jesus. Best thing for my kids. I know that sounds hard, but I, we've got to get this thing right. And if we don't get it right, we're, gonna, we're not going to sustain when times get tough. And I, I have an obligation to you because I've been given this responsibility of preaching and teaching the gospel. And I have an obligation to you. One day I will stand before God and he will ask me, did you tell him the truth? Did you love them enough? I don't want to fail. And it's easy to do because if there's anything that I have been susceptible in my life, it is to be, it is, (coughs) excuse me, it is to fall into the trap of wanting to please people. It is, uh, it's a part of the fabric of who I am. It's something I have to guard against. And here, I am, I, I genuinely want only good things for you. I really, that is my heart. I, but to tell you something that isn't true will hurt you in the deepest and most profound way. And if we sign up to follow Jesus and I don't inform you that there could, there's a cost to that, then what happens is you come across a bad thing that happens in your life and then you go, what happened? And I have done you a disservice. We are not exempted from trial. And we are not exempted from persecution. We're not exempted from hardship. What we are given, though, is a God who will walk through us, with us through it, who will provide for us in it, and who will take us to something better eventually. And because we've taught that what matters is what happens in this world, we've lost sight of the fact that what matters really is what happens in the world that yet to come. I I know I'm... Everything I do now determines what happens there. 
And I want to be faithful now. Amen? So, you know, if you're going to walk in ministry, and if you're going to walk, and, and by the way, all of us are called to ministry. I'm going to say that again. If we're going to be a follower of Jesus, we've got to have these things worked in the fabric. And we can't create them. We have to pray them. We have to ask God to work them into the fabric of who we are. We have to be willing to do that. We have to count the cost, and we have to say, Jesus, I want to die to you, die out of myself and live to you each and every day, sometimes moments in the day. I want my heart to be so sold to you that I love you above all other things, and that I love those things that you love, that I'm willing, God, to hear your heart, how I creatively can find a way to, to reach those that are broken, and I can help them see who you are and point them to you so that you get all the glory and they get all the benefit of having a relationship with you. Amen? So I, you know, here I am today, and we're about to do something really fun and cool, but I think Sherry understands this probably as well as anybody. Being a follower of Jesus is the best, the most wonderful, the most glorious, the most incredible thing you can ever do. It will also cost you everything. And some days, that's hard. And so today, you know, I... I, I am excited about what God's going to do today. I'm excited about what we're recognizing He has done. But I'm challenging all of us. I believe that we will see the most incredible things. I believe that God will do things that we have no idea when we begin to buy into this. I believe that. And uh, I'm committed to it. You know, I, I've been concerned about where our world is headed. I, I, I pray for my children and my grandchildren. What's the world they are going to grow up in and live in? But here's the thing. I know this. As long as Jesus is in their life, then they're going to be okay. They're going to be okay. They'll be all right. And I have to trust that with all my heart. Amen? So at this time, I'm going to ask Sherry to come. Sherry Holland. In the Assemblies of God, which is not anything but an institution that we have affiliated with for protection and for guidance and for resourcing, we have been given the opportunity in our local church to credential people into ministry. It does not carry the same weight as what we credential them, but it carries the weight of a recognition of a special role that they are playing in the church. Today we are going to recognize one of our own. And so Sherry, if you come to the forward here, to the front. And if those whom, if uh, her posse will come. Huh? No, I knew that they were coming. Oh, the prayer posse. Oh, I didn't know that. I just called them that. I... So I gave them their name. Uh, this is their part of their prayer posse. If my elders and those deacons that are here today, if you would come at this time too, if they would come. Now you six feet apart if you can, guys. Here we go. If any else, anybody else that wants to come, but we're gonna we're gonna commission Sherry into ministry today. Thank you. 
This is weird. This COVID thing makes things weird. Oh. Sherry's been on a long journey. And uh, it, uh, she and I have been walking together for a long time. She and her family uh, have been a part of Southside uh, longer than I have, as far as I know. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I first met Sherry's family uh, when I was in school at, at uh, Southeastern. I, uh, I didn't know it. I went to dedicate my niece at a church in Merritt Island, Florida, and they were there. Didn't know that years later I would be privileged to be their pastor. Uh, and uh, and in this, I've watched Sherry grow and develop and walk through the challenges and the trials that have brought her to this place today. She is an amazing prayer warrior. She is a passionate and compassionate heart for God. And she's been called to serve the homeless of our community. And so today we, we recognize her and commission her into ministry. This will help her in her ministry. Gives her some uh, opportunities to step into some roles. Uh, but we do this recognizing this is not a human institution. It's a divine. So if I can... Um, if you will just put that on you right now. Casey is putting a stole on her. I want to share with you about that. A minister must cherish their anointing. He or she must live in the power and the presence of God. Without it, they cannot fulfill their call. Standing in the door of a lonely cave at Mount Horeb, God shared with the prophet Elijah that his earthly ministry was complete. He instructed him to anoint Elisha to succeed him. He went and found Elisha plowing in a field. He came and he threw his mantle upon him, and Elisha burned the plow and set out to follow Elijah. When it came time for God to take Elijah to heaven, Elisha, in anticipation, clung close to Elijah and they went from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho to Jordan. Elijah, coming to the water's edge, struck the water with his mantle. The waters parted, and they crossed over. Then Elisha made his famous request for a double portion of Elijah's anointing. At that fateful moment, the chariots of fire dipped down, and Elijah disappeared into heaven. Elisha looked down and picked up the mantle, went back to the river, struck the water, and the water supernaturally parted for him. God's people who were watching recognized the anointing of Elijah rested on Elisha. From that day, the mantle is symbolized in imparting ministry. The mantle is but a symbol. God's presence, his power, your fruitfulness your, will authenticate the call and the appointment of God upon your life. Today you will be given a stole. It is but a symbol. Keep it as a constant reminder that there is no ministry apart from the anointing and that as a minister you must continually be robed in the Spirit of God. Cherish your anointing. Without it, you cannot fulfill God's call. I'm going to ask you to to speak to a vow, Sherry, and I'll tell you what to say. Okay? Sherry, do you solemnly pledge to give yourself unreservedly to the ministry and to live as becomes a vessel chosen of God to lead people from darkness to light? If that's true, say yes, with God's help I do. Will you uphold the name of the Lord in the eyes of the world and live a life that becomes your high and holy calling? Yes, with God's help I will. Will you love and defend God's people so as to bring unity and blessing, giving special regard to hold your fellow ministers in high esteem? Yes, with God's help, I will. And in the tradition of the apostles, will you give yourself to, the, to prayer and to the study of God's word? Yes, with God's help, I will. Your commitment is sacred and you vows that you have spoken are powerful commitments. You cannot do this on your own. 
No man or woman stands as an island. We are connected. That's why they need a prayer posse. The life of a believer in Jesus Christ is always shared life. This is especially true of those who are called to be vessels of honor. Since New Testament times, a special impartation has been given through the laying on of hands. Paul reminds Timothy, for this reason I remind you, flame, fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and teaching, and do not neglect your gift which is in you through prophecy. <clears throat> when the body of elders laid their hands upon you, today the leaders of this church and this community of believers will stand with you. Let them always be a part of your life and ministry. So let us pray. And if your posse can reach your hand out, we, we're trying to be careful here. <laughs> Actually, I think you guys can on the back. You know, that's okay. We'll trust the God. Just don't get too close, okay? She's got coot. No. <laughs> Lord, we ask right now for the impartation of your Holy Spirit upon this, your chosen vessel, for the ministry that she has been called to. She has prepared, she has studied, she has worked, she has done the work, she has lived the life, and she has now come to this point where we recognize and we commission her into the Spirit-filled ministry. And Lord, we pray, Father, that as she goes about with her prayer and with her service to those who are broken and who are in need, we ask, God, you would give her a special impartation of your Spirit to do that which she cannot do on her own. We, O oh Lord, are dependent upon you. It is not by might, and it is not by power, but it is by your Spirit, says the Lord. So, Father, let the anointing rest upon you, her, as it has come from you. Lord, we pray right now through the laying on of hands that that gift which is within her will be stirred up into a flame and that she will walk in the power and the might of her God. Lord, we pray for lives to be changed, souls to be saved, people's needs to be met because of the faithfulness of your chosen one. And Lord, we thank you for it, for we declare it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Sharing, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, at his appearing and at his kingdom, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, revoke, excuse me, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Watch thou in all things and make full proof of your ministry. <clears throat> By the power invested in me as an ordained minister of the church of Jesus Christ and as the pastor of Southside Assembly of God and on behalf of the deacons and congregation of Southside Assembly of God, I hereby commission you to the full gospel ministry in the church of Jesus Christ in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of an everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in that in you that which is well and pleasing in the sight through our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Congratulations. That was Katie, by the way. <laughs> You're commissioned into ministry. Do you want to say anything? You can. It's up to you. Uh, I just want to thank God for being here this morning and all through the time I've been part of this fellowship. And Pastor Jack does my ministry in prayer. And I agree with that. That's just part of my I'm 
just as God needs to wear In case you didn't hear, she said that you know she's been called to prayer for a long time, and I agree, but she's been feel called to get outside the walls of the church to minister to those that are broken, and particularly the homeless. We're giving her these credentials because it will help her in, the, in doing that ministry so that she can resource and do things that maybe she couldn't do without them. Uh, it's a vehicle that we have here as a means to help people. Uh, if you're interested in that, we'll have happy to talk to you about that. We would love to do that. I believe this, though. Every one of you have been called to do ministry. Every one of you. And I believe there's somebody that only you can reach and impact with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe there's a uniqueness in way you can do it. I don't care what it is. You know, somehow we have gotten locked into that God only does certain things in certain ways. I actually believe that we're in the day of the creative use of the kingdom, that we're going to see things that, from soccer games to whatever it is for the kingdom to move forward. And I believe that what we've been looking for, what we've been hungry for, will begin to happen. You know, from the gathering of folks that just inviting their friends and, and they have sh shared a, a cup of coffee or whatever, whatever it is, we're going to see the gospel go forward. It's time. Amen? Amen. Will you rise with me, please? If you did not write these things down that I share with you, we will make them available to you. I know that's seven things. That was a lot. Oh. But uh, please, please don't just... You know, the Bible talks about hearing and not doing. <laughs> but there's power when we become doers of the word. Amen? Will the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. May he watch over you and protect you. May he guide you into all truth and lead you in all ways. May he call you to himself and may on that glorious day when he returns, may you be among the chosen ones. And I declare it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.